Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Daily Grey Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 21st of January 2022. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So, another <laughs> kind of crappy day in the markets, right? I was shitposting all day on Twitter with kind of like bear tweets out there. I'm not kind of like bearish, guys. Like, I, as you guys know, like I'm always bullish, but um, yeah, it wasn't a great day. I think... You know, what made it worse was that I guess yesterday before I went to bed, it was like, what, 2 a.m. or something like that, my time, and ETH had gone back up to like 32 or 3300. It was, you know, it was, it was going really well, and I went to sleep, and I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. ETH's gone back up. That's nice. And then I, I woke up, and I woke up to a message from a friend who said, ETH not looking too hot, and I'm like, what? Like, I went to bed, and it was doing really well, and I looked at the price, and it was 2900, and I was like, oh, okay, what happens? Um, and then I saw that uh, basically stocks took another time. Uh, apparently, Netflix uh, missed their expected earnings, so that meant that ETH would dump or that crypto should dump. I don't know. Like, apparently, according to one of my friends, Netflix is usually first or one of the first in earnings season to kind of like uh, announce their earnings. And if they miss the mark, then um, it's more likely the other tech companies will miss the mark as well on their expected earnings, which means it's kind of like bearish. I, I don't know. Like, as I've said to you guys before, the macro environment is incredibly hard to read, right? Like for, especially for for um, people like us who just, you know, a lot of us don't come from traditional finance. A lot of us never paid attention to macro. A lot of us didn't even know kind of like what the Fed was or who Jerome Powell was <laughs> before we we got into kind of crypto investing, right? But now, you know, it's what we what we kind of like talk about all the time. But I think when when you kind of like think about it and think about it from the perspective of, uh, you know, what, what is the okay? The market might may, maybe bearish right now, and I mean, it's pretty hard to deny that we're in a bear market. We pretty much are. I mean, the every single pump just keeps getting sold down. To me, that's a very classic uh, kind of like sign that that we're in a bear market, and also. Uh, when there's really good news and the price kind of like does nothing, uh, doesn't react positively and goes down again, that is another telltale sign of uh, a bear market. Because, you know, I remember the perfect example of going the other way was back in, I think it was 2020 or, or yeah, I think it was 2020. Back in 2020, um, uh, BitMEX basically, or maybe maybe 2019. I don't know. I can't remember now, but it was one of those years. I'm pretty sure it was 2020. Um, BitMEX uh, kind of like uh, got the, um, I can't remember what regulator it was, but they went after them. And basically, uh, BitMEX was a huge exchange back then. The huge perpetuals exchange was responsible for a lot of volume, uh, especially on the kind of like leverage side of things. But they got hit with some kind of like uh, regulatory action. I think the founders got charged with some criminal stuff. Uh, and then the price didn't really go down. It actually, I mean, it went down a little bit, but then it kind of bounced back up straight away. And kind of like, when you see that, you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, this bad news didn't actually make the price go down. The price is actually going up. So the momentum is there because the market is always about the momentum. If there is a strong bearish momentum, it doesn't matter what news comes out or what good news and positive news comes out. The, the momentum remains bearish. And the same is true for the bullish momentum. It doesn't matter what bad news comes out. You still keep going up. Like think about all the bad news that came out during uh, basically from March, 2020, the bottom to May 2021, which is the first top that we kind of like had there. Think about the amount of bad news that came out. There was so much bad regulatory news that was coming out at the time, but the price kept ignoring that and kept going up. I remember there was some really shitty regulatory news uh, out of the US basically saying that they were going to ban people from being able to withdraw from an exchange to their own wallet. So withdraw like ETH to your own kind of Ethereum wallet. And this was pretty, uh, this was pretty, um, a pretty big deal. And there was a lot of fight around this. And then ETH was like $500, $600 or something and obviously ETH went a lot higher than that after that then we had the infrastructure bill stuff that that kind of like came along too but so we had a lot of bad news but it didn't didn't matter when the momentum was bullish but now the momentum is is definitely bearish right we're we're pretty massively off the all-time high now where the all-time was 4900 we're at 2900 at time of recording or even below that i think uh, last time i checked we're at almost 2800 again now and it doesn't seem like we're going to stop going down but who knows right who knows in the in the kind of like short to medium term obviously still long term bullish but i think that you need to kind of realize that at the moment, we're pretty much at the mercy of the macro environment, especially at the mercy of, of stocks and kind of like uh, rates being raised and all that sort of stuff. And the way to navigate that is just to play defensively. So, I mean, this is an investment advice. This is just general advice when you're kind of like, 
you know, in the in the kind of in this ecosystem, don't blow yourself up. Like that's pretty much number one rule. Like don't kind of like leverage up and get yourself blown up on leverage and lose your position. Because what ends up happening for a lot of the times, people lose their position and then the market goes back up again and they're not in it at all. So, I mean, there's nothing worse than losing your position, so losing money, and then the market going back up again and you not being in it and you're not making money again, right? Or not making back the money, the paper gains that you kind of lost. And then if you get some more money, you have to buy back in higher than what you kind of like lost your money at. So it kind of like very, very much uh, stings there. And, and, and I've, I've seen a fair p- few people go through this. So definitely not something fun to experience. So I think that is the golden rule. Just don't blow yourself up. Uh, but the second rule is kind of like, if you're going to buy, I mean, dollar cost averaging in works during, I think like the, bear, I think it works during kind of like bear markets. In bull markets, I never liked dollar cost averaging in during bull markets because it, it, if, you, if you do it like weekly, for example, you could like, because the price can move so quickly, you can end up buying like double what the price was a week prior sometimes or or, or, or higher and it's kind of like Eh, I don't know. I, I like it better on the way down than the way up. But uh, that's another thing you could be doing. I know people kind of like look at these prices today, and especially if you're an ETH bull or 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 a bull or a crypto bull in general, and you think to yourself, "Wow, this is on sale. I'm going to buy, buy, buy." But the thing is, is that it's it's kind of hard because you could end up ca- catching that falling knife, right? Where it, it falls a lot lower than you thought it would. And if you're a long-term investor, I mean, it, it'll be fine because obviously you believe it's going to go back up. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't say it's going to be fine. You believe it's going to be fine. Like obviously, nothing is guaranteed when it comes to investing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, and this is why the momentum can stay bearish because people get too scared to buy, but then eventually you know, enough people kind of like get the confidence again. They're like, okay, well, you know, we've been at this price point for a while. feels like a bottom. I'm going to buy in here. And then the momentum shifts to bullish and the sellers are basically exhausted and we, we, go, we go back up. So I think the longer term, the momentum shifts are much easier to spot. Uh, short term, it's very, very hard. Like, it, it, it takes a while to spot it, honestly. Like you, you do, you won't actually know until it's confirmed. Because I think the way what I waited for, for with ETH in 2020 was when ETH got back above, I think three or four hundred dollars. That's when I kind of knew because it hadn't been back to that price for a very long time. I was kind of okay. Well, the momentum is definitely bullish now. Uh, plus, it was kind of uh, the price was ignoring all the bad news and things like that. And there was a lot of um, exciting stuff happening within the ETH ecosystem, uh, especially around DeFi. So that was obviously adding fuel to the fire, that's when I kind of like knew the momentum has shifted. But the thing is, is that uh, the momentum had already shifted uh, when we hit the bottom in March of 2020 to, I think it even shifted before that. I think the momentum shifted in January of 2020. Then we had that kind of like, people like to call it like the scam dump because we dumped because of the COVID stuff. Um, but you didn't know until it was confirmed, uh, until we got over the price that we hadn't been at in quite a while since basically, you know, 2018 or, or, or 2017 when we were going back up. Uh, and then if you had bought at 400 instead of bought at $80, you'd be buying much higher, but it was a much safer bet because you basically had not guarantees, but you had relative certainty that the momentum had shifted. Whereas buying in at the, at the lows, I mean, if you were doing it for like the longer term, that'd be fine. I mean, buying at those prices just generally would have been fine, but you never know, right? So short to medium term, momentum shifts very, very hard to spot unless you're a really good trader or unless you're kind of like really good at reading the signals i'm definitely not longer term much easier to spot and i can tell you right now the fact that um the the two things i look for good news doing nothing to the price and every kind of like a positive price movement getting sold down those two are the telltale signs for me for a bear market now could the bear market end now and momentum shift to bullish i mean sure it could but will we know until that's the case and uh, for you know uh, immediately we won't right we'll have to wait and see because we could go back up to four thousand but then drop back down, right? I think before you can actually say that the momentum has shifted bullish again, I think we would have to get back to almost all-time high, which is 4,900 to, to say that. I, I think it's going to be very hard for, for, for people to say that, even if we go back to 4,000. But it also depends on how long we spend around price price points and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, anyway, I think I'm going to end it there with the price talk. I just, I did, I know I've talked about price recently um, and nothing's changed in terms of kind of like the fundamental uh, reasons to be bullish on Ethereum and ETH. Obviously, the merge and stuff still happening this year and ERP-1559 is still burning ETH and all that other stuff. I'm not going to rehash it again. But I think that when it comes to the price action right now, it's in the hands of the macro environment. There's nothing that you or I can do. So just don't blow yourself up. Buy more if you want to buy more. Choose the price that you want to buy at. You just have to pull the trigger. If you, know, if you buy now and it falls another 50%, 
you, you got to be comfortable with that, right? Like I've done that before. I bought I bought plenty of times where the price has fell fallen fifty percent during <laughs> during like kind of like twenty nineteen um, and even twenty twenty. But like, I I think I bought at the beginning of. 2020 and then the COVID dump happened and I'm pretty sure it went down more than 50% from when I bought because I think I bought into the the, the initial rally there at the, at, at, in early 2020. So I know the feeling just as well as anyone, um, but those are the two things that you can do right now anyway. But anyway, on to some more positive news uh, from the last 24 hours. So Marius, who I talk about a lot with regards to the merge, uh, put together a Twitter thread today that uh, they just shadow forked the girly test net uh, as, as part of the merge kind of like testing effort here. So what does this mean? Well, basically, Marius explains it here. They tested the merge on a real test net. The DevOps wizards deployed a Genesis contract on girly and deposited enough validators to start a chain. It went through all the stages of the merge, um, although we kind of effed up and had to reconvict the nodes at some point. Now the merge test net runs in parallel to girly. Transactions from Girly are also executed on the test net, so we finally have a real world loads, and the network is finalizing. There are still some issues. Uh, there are some issues still persisting, and we found loads of pitfalls and issues during deployment. All in all, really great effort and a huge leap forward for merge testing. We will probably leave our shadow fork up and running for a couple of days until the issues are fixed, and we can try again. Big props to uh, a few other people that made this happen: Paratosh, who I've talked about before, and Raphael here as well. So uh, this is really, really cool. This means that, you know, the girly test net, which for the developers out there, you know how popular this test net is, um, it basically you know, got shadow forked into a kind of like merge test net and is now uh, proof of stake, right? So that's very, very cool. Like the, the original girly test net still exists as a kind of like a proof of work one that didn't change, but they kind of like forked off of that and, and, and it worked. So very, very cool to see this. I mean, Honestly, the progress on the merge has been blowing my mind. Like how quickly these guys are doing some, are, are doing this, and, and how much uh, I guess enthusiasm there is about the merge. Not just from a technical perspective, but from a social one, from a kind of like getting us off proof of work finally. Because you know the proof of work rhetoric uh, or the bad narratives around it are really picking up steam lately. I'm seeing a lot more, I guess, uh, people talk about it, a lot more governments talk about it. And obviously it's a pretty big deal within kind of like crowds like the NFT crowd for, for better or worse, right? It doesn't matter if they're misguided or not. So I think that uh, obviously I've said it plenty of times before, the, the sooner we get to the proof of stake, the better. And I'm actually curious to see how this all affects the price too. Like, you know, the, if the merge gets scheduled for June, is ETH price going to run up massively in anticipation of that massive kind of like 80-90% supply shock? I'm still confident it will. I'm, I, I, I can't imagine a world where there's that strong of a narrative around ETH that the price isn't going to go up leading up to it. Uh, I know I just said before that um, during kind of like uh, bear, bearish momentum sh uh, shifts, really good news doesn't do anything for the price. But this is less of a news event and more of a kind of like anticipated event that has a direct, uh, uh, has a direct impact on the ETH supply which then has a direct impact on the ETH uh, uh, market dynamics, which should have a direct impact on the price. But also by June, we could be back to a bull market, right? We could we could have shifted momentum by June. I mean, it's still like a few months away. I'm not sure if we will, but I just can't imagine a world where ETH doesn't do something leading up to it. And if it doesn't, I mean, that just makes it even more explosive once the momentum shifts bullish again, because we're going to have 80 to 90% less sell pressure. Actually, no, for the first six months, we're going to have 100% less sell pressure because there's no... With withdrawals for six months after the merge. So there can actually be no new ETH entering circulation. And we'll obviously have the burn still going. So we'll be, you know, massively net deflationary. I, I don't know. I just can't imagine a world where it doesn't do positively in that environment, but we'll, ha we'll have to see. Um, I think, um, you know, it's going to be funny if if this narrative is so powerful and this kind of like supply shock is so powerful, we could actually flip Bitcoin in a, in a, in a bear market. That'd be hilarious, right? But we'll have to see. I'm not going to, you know, I, I think uh, whenever people talk about the flipping too much, uh, it, it ends up being quite bearish for, for the ETH BTC ratio, which has obviously come down from the highs um, due to kind of like the crash and things like that. But anyway, regardless of the price here, I think the progress on the merge has been awesome. And of course, I will keep you guys up to date on any other updates that come out. So another piece of big news today, and again, this is news that came out and didn't, and the price did nothing. Um, Twitter announced today that you can now uh, set your NFT as your profile picture, and it turns your uh, your um, I guess like Twitter profile picture uh, container into a hexagon. So try and scroll down here and see if I can have if there's any examples of people that oh, here there here there's one. You can see it's a hexagon, and the normal ones are kind of like uh, circles. 
Um, and yeah, look, I, I read through the comments here. There's so many kind of so much hate in these comments. I mean, you can see this this meme here. Reminder that this is a thing now. Use it. Um, you can actually mute accounts who use the NFT avatar integration. So that's pretty wild. I actually think that that was a. I thought that was a Photoshop at first, but apparently it's a real, it's a real thing. Um, wait, no, no. Oh, I, I wait. I, I don't think it's actually real. You should use TweetDate. Been using it for years, man. Okay, apparently it's not real. But like, I, you know what? The funny thing is, is that it wouldn't be hard to do this. Uh, oh, this is on TweetDeck, not on the official Twitter. Oh, okay, so if it's actually real on TweetDeck, then I mean that makes sense because TweetDeck is kind of like a third party um, service there. But this is pretty hilarious, right? Like that that um, people are still hating on NFTs so much. You know, Brad now add a listing of the climate impact of each MST on uh, NFT on the details screen too. <laughs> and then this person like sent from an iPhone <laughs> you know I, I don't know the comments are just stupid like I'm not going to get bogged down in them but what I find really cool about this is this NFTs are going so mainstream guys it's actually incredible I mean this was teased for a while but the fact that like Twitter did this really quickly is, is awesome um, and, and the fact that you can now kind of like essentially verify that you own the NFT without having to kind of go verify it on um on uh, on OpenSea or on Etherscan or anything like that, you can just verify it straight on Twitter, and it lets uh, you kind of like differentiate between people who have an NFT profile picture and those who don't. Now, I I I, I would have liked for it to be kind of like uh, for it, for it to have been like a badge on the Twitter profile picture, like an like a little Ethereum icon badge instead of a hexagon. But I guess a hexagon visually makes more sense. But uh, you know, if they start supporting more chains than just Ethereum, then they may do that, right? They may do the badge as well. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see kind of like how that plays out there. But I thought this video was quite cool as well. I mean, you can, you can watch the video. Usually these videos are cringe, but I actually thought this one was actually really well done. The animations were very high quality and it didn't come across as cringe at all. It just came across as kind of like um, someone who was native to the Web3 NFT ecosystem knew what they were doing and you had to kind of like appeal to appeal to kind of like these people so i, I really like the video but the wallets that are supported are coinbase wallet rainbow metamask uh trust wallet argent and ledger live i believe wallet connect is also supported with that which is really cool as well but yeah just another example of nfts going super mainstream here really really cool to see this and i guess another nft related announcement was that adidas originals have announced that uh, they're teaming up with prada to do an uh, what they're calling an ambitious first of its kind nft project featuring user generated and creator owned art in collaboration with digital artist zag lieberman here so uh there's more details here um i believe this is on polygon as well so if i just click into this website let's see um so this is basically the the uh, quick intro of it adidas and prada reward holders of adidas originals into the metaverse nfts uh and bridge the gap for a new community of creators to join the innovative world of web 3 so uh there's more information here there's a, like there's a basically an faq um you know uh what is the uh, adidas prada resource uh I mean, there's lots of different kind of like questions and answers here, right? You can see this. Um, and as I said, it is on Polygon, which is really cool, which means, I mean, Polygon's a POS network, right? So it means it's kind of like, uh, it's not using lots of energy and it's also very, very cheap being the, the POS network there. Um, so basically what do you get uh, if you participate in Adidas uh, for Prada Resource? So as a co-creator, you mint a tile NFT free of charge. Your tile forms part of a final artwork canvas created by Zach. NFT tile creators receive 3% of secondary market sales in perpetuity of their individual tile after secondary marketplace fees have been deducted, e.g. OpenSea. That's wild seeing kind of like OpenSea on, on Adidas's website here. And same with Matic, uh, Matic and Polygon. Um, and, equal, and you also receive an equal share among all tile creators of 15% of the final canvas sale auction so this is basically you know adidas and prada doing kind of like a collaboration for an art piece where um everyone can kind of participate and get rewarded for it. well not everyone but like you know the community can participate and get kind of like rewarded for it with royalties and things like that uniquely enabled by nfts this is really cool obviously adidas is an absolutely massive brand i think that you know, Nike uh, acquired RTFKT, which is another NFT brand. So Adidas definitely needs to be doing things <laughs> with the NFT stuff and um, in the and in the metaverse. And you can see even in their bio, Adidas has uh, into the metaverse here. So I think uh, it's pretty cool how involved these brands are getting. I think they're acutely aware of um, of uh, kind of like these, uh, I guess like 
trend shifts and kind of like where the puck is going, not where it's been, and, and kind of like being counterculture. Because funny enough, NFTs are still pretty counterculture, especially because of all the hate that they still get. And eventually, as I said, like the other day, I think the hate is inconsequential. It's it's irrelevant. I think eventually uh, everyone's going to be using NFTs in one way or another, and the hate is just going to dissipate away. It doesn't really matter for adoption or anything like that. But it's still very, very cool to see this. So if you want to learn more information about this, definitely go check out the FAQ here and the about page and there's also a discord channel that you can get involved with as well uh, another NFT related uh, bit of news here that I, f- I, f- I, um, I forgot that I had lined up for today. So apparently Meta, which is Facebook's parent company, is looking to launch an NFT marketplace. Now, I can't remember if there was like uh, news about this already over the last few months, like rumors. I think there was. I mean, I think people just kind of like drew the lines. Well, if Facebook's going all in on the metaverse, then, then they need to have a marketplace. Now, this is going to be obviously super centralized, even more centralized than OpenSea is today. But I think that Look, I think if that if it's a marketplace where, okay, the marketplace is super centralized, but you can buy and sell NFTs that aren't centralized on it. So like NFTs that are, live on Ethereum or Polygon and things like that. I think that is a nice little middle ground. But if it's literally just like a Facebook NFT marketplace with only Facebook NFTs and only Instagram NFTs and stuff like that, I think that's pretty crappy. And I don't actually think that would go very far. I think people would actually gravitate towards the more open solutions that they can have all their NFTs in rather than the Facebook approved NFTs. So we're going to have to see kind of like how that how that plays out there. Um, I don't think there was too much detail in this article from the, from the block about uh, about what they're doing. I think it was just kind of like some uh, some news they got from a source here. Um, yeah, so citing several people familiar with the matter. So there, there's no official announcement or anything like that, but the block is usually pretty good with their sources. So I'm curious to see what this looks like. And as I said, I hope that it's not just kind of like uh, Facebook NFTs. I hope that it's actually like NFTs on, on, on all these open blockchains and open platforms because that would be a lot more interesting to me at least. So uh, FTX announced yesterday that they now support the Polygon mainnet. So you can withdraw your funds from the FTX exchange if you use FTX to the Polygon POS chain. This is really cool. I hope this means that FTX is going to be supporting uh, other kind of like chains like L2s and stuff like Arbitrum and Optimism and all that good stuff there. I think they will. FTX is one is, is, is one of the more forward-looking exchanges. Even though they've got like their big supporters, obviously, of the Solana ecosystem because SBF is a big supporter of the Solana ecosystem. I think, as I've discussed before, because Ethereum and, and and Ethereum scaling solutions are kind of like credibly neutral, it's okay for these exchanges to support them. And as I said, like, as I've been talking about Binance supports Arbitrum and stuff like that, but that was a surprise to me because I didn't think that that CZ would do that. But I mean, you know, uh, I, I give credit where it's due. And um, this just goes back to the credible neutrality thing. So... You know, it's funny. I don't think FTX would ever support direct uh, withdrawals to BSC. Maybe they already do. Like, uh, see, I don't, I don't know because I don't use these centralized exchanges, guys. The only ones, only centralized exchanges I use are the ones that I use as a fiat on an off ramp. I don't use them to trade anything else because obviously I use DeFi. But um, I don't know if they actually do that. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't because, as I said, credible neutrality is important. FTX and Binance are direct competitors, so why would FTX send, uh, enable uh, uh, make it easy for their users to go to BSC? Right, FTX obviously doesn't have it. Obviously, doesn't have its own blockchain, but it does it have. It does support Solana, and it obviously kind of like does um. It does kind of enable withdrawals in that to Solana. But the thing is, is that they're also going to support Ethereum and Ethereum scaling solutions because it's a huge market there and it's credibly neutral, meaning that they're not kind of like uh, giving uh, power to competitors or anything like that. Ethereum is not a competitor to FTX in the sense that it's a centralized exchange. Obviously, Ethereum DeFi is a competitor to FTX, but they're hedging that bet by being kind of like all in on the Solana ecosystem and the Solana DeFi ecosystem. But them have, you know, enabling kind of like uh, withdrawals and deposits for Pal- Pal- Polygon and other kind of like scaling solutions um, is not going to hurt their business. It's actually going to be better for their business. So yeah, I think that I thought that was uh, just uh, something, something interesting to bring up, but really cool to see that they're supporting Polygon now. So speaking of scaling, Nurex here on Twitter uh, basically has a really great tweet where they said, the gas savings that an L2 like Optimism can provide are exponentially greater for complex tra- complex transactions. Transferring ETH on L2 is only five times cheaper on L1, but minting SUSD with synthetics is 142 times cheaper and buying and selling options on Lyra is 269 times cheaper. Not to mention perpetual protocol savings coming in at a whopping 530X. L2 is going to open up new possibilities and Optimism is leading the way. This is so this is really cool for two reasons. The first reason is that a lot of these apps haven't been optimized for optimism yet. 
I think Lyra has because they're natively deployed there. And Synthetics probably has to an extent because they kind of migrated there. Um, but like a lot of them still haven't kind of got the, the juice out of um, Optimism that they can get. Like, for example, Uniswap, there's actually a fork of Uniswap called ZipSwap that optimized themselves for um, for Optimism and have gotten the, uh, gotten cheaper fees than uh, than Uniswap has because of that. Now, uh, obviously, to Nurex's tweet here about kind of... Um, complex transaction costs coming down, this is what we want to see because, you know, transferring ETH and and like tokens on an L2 is all well and good, but the real value prop of the Ethereum network and the real value prop of scaling solutions is, is kind of like DeFi, NFTs, the complex stuff. And if we can't get those costs down, then really, I mean, most people aren't going to care about trans just transferring ETH, right? Because like it's it's just not the use case that most people are uh, are using ETH for. Whereas uh, they are using DeFi and NFTs and stuff like that. So very very cool to see this. This comes from a um an optimism uh, dashboard on Dune Analytics that I don't think Nurex kind of linked that here. No, he has he, they haven't linked that here. But uh, I think I've linked this before or talked about this dashboard before. But you could go to Dune Analytics' website and find this dashboard anyway there. But yeah, very, very cool to see the uh, huge gas savings that can be had here for complex transactions. So speaking of L2 again, L2 Beat now supports a Stark Net. So you can go to this kind of like page here and see uh, all the information about Stark Net. Uh, the TVL is zero right now because there aren't any bridges deployed to Stark Net yet. So there's actually no kind of like TVL in there yet. Um, but you can still find all the information you need about Stark Net. So here is a general pr purpose ZK roll up. Uh, what you know, what risks there are with using Stark Net right now? What technology that it's using? What the operator is like? Emergency exit? Smart contracts? References, all the usual information that you see for the other projects on L2 Beat is now available here for StarkNet. So very, very cool to see this. If you want to learn more about StarkNet or, and, and get all the resources, then you should definitely go check this page out. It'll be linked in the YouTube description. So the final thing to talk about today was this picture from Jack, where he basically said trust versus verify. And it's just like a picture. I mean, for those listening to the podcast, it's just a, uh, an image with a white background. And on the left side, it's a Twitter verification badge. So the little kind of like badge with the tick on it. And on the right side, it's the success prompt that you see on Etherscan when you look at transactions where it's like success in green, which I'm sure we've all seen before. Now, on with the Twitter verification badge, you're trusting that uh, you're, you're trusting Twitter in that case. You can't verify. Verify Twitter's centralized database. You can't kind of like look at it yourself. You're basically trusting that uh, that Twitter is kind of like verified the right people, and that and that kind of like is the um is the non scam account, and that Twitter has kind of like done their proper due diligence to give a verification badge to an account. And then we're on the right, whereas on the right side, yes, while you may be trusting Etherscan when you look at that success uh, prompt on Etherscan, the thing is, is that you can verify that for yourself. You can run your own full node, or you can check another an, uh, one of the other multiple kind of like sources out there for Ethereum blockchain data and check that that transaction it was successful and did actually happen. Uh, and that is the main difference between trusting and and verifying. And obviously, there's a hybrid model where you can trust a centralized service like Etherscan um, to, as kind of like soft trust, but then verify it later on using your own full node or something like that. Now, this is just a simple example. Where, where it gets really cool is when we think about the things that we can verify using the Ethereum blockchain. Think of DeFi, for example. Think of Maker and think of DAI. All the assets backing DAI are in a smart contract on Ethereum that anyone at any time can view and can verify the assets there. So I can go there right now, like obviously using Etherscan, but I could use my own full node if I wanted to, and I could query it myself, but I could basically go to Etherscan, I could go look at the smart contract for all the assets backing DAI, and I can see that they're all there. And I can do that within a matter of minutes. I can do that from anywhere in the world. I don't have to ask anyone's permission. It's all, uh, it's all open to me to, to, to do that. Now, if you were to do something like that in the traditional finance system, it's basically impossible. Banks and, and, and traditional financial institutions are not going to give you access to their back end. You know, they're not going to let you look at their books. They're not going to let you look in and see what they've got under the hood. And I mean, for good reason on, on the privacy side. But uh, the thing is, is that that's why we have kind of like financial regulators, right? They're allowed to kind of look at that stuff. And that's what keeps them in check. But then we're still trusting the financial regulators or, or you know, basically a third party to keep them in check. And as we all know, a lot of these financial regulators are kind of useless and you know they're inf they're fallible as well like they're they're um they're subject to bribes they're subject to political wills and 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 all that sorts of stuff there so that is a stark difference but obviously there's a trade off with ethereum where there's a privacy trade off with, that you don't get but we're working on that with privacy te technologies that are coming so but 
back to the main point about how the fact is we can just verify this sort of stuff within within minutes from anywhere in the world without asking anyone's permission is a, a killer feature of DeFi. And it's not just for things like assets backing DAI. It's for literally anything. You can even look at the smart contract and look and see if it's actually doing what the developers claim that it's doing um, if the smart contract has been verified and if it hasn't, you uh, you don't you just simply don't use the kind of like app because you don't trust it. Right? You're like, okay, well, I don't know what this smart contract is doing. I'm not going to use this. That is just such a massive difference between, I guess, like the existing traditional system and the new system that we're building. And it is what separates, uh, I guess, like the trust from the verification. And as I said, there is soft trust in Web3 as well, where you basically trust places like Etherscan, but the the difference is that you can verify that for yourself. Whereas in Twitter verification ba badge land, or just like in any centralized kind of like land, um, you have to trust, it's a hard trust. You don't have a way to verify it yourself. You're not allowed to verify it yourself. It's all closed to you. And if you wanted to go through it, the massive kind of like process to do it, and somehow how get access to the information that you, you were trying to get access to, it would probably cost you a lot of money, it would take a long time, and there's no guarantee of success either. So from that perspective, it's just a night and day difference. Uh, and I just yeah, I just wanted to kind of like give those examples there. But I think on that note, I'm going to end it there for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks everyone.